Thank you, Andrew, and um, hello, everyone. If my voice goes sort of all Theresa May on a bad day, uh, it's because I seem to be about to get a cold, but I hope it'll hold up. Um, just um, to say how much I've been enjoying the festival, I, it is very much a festival rather than a summer school. It's not dogmatic, it's not didactic. There's a lot of exploration going on here, and I think it's tremendous, and I enjoyed it hugely. Um, I have to share my bit about Protestants, because I was brought up living beside Protestants. And now, I was a child who was very much the youngest and always trying to make sense of my household, which was not at all easy. Um, but what was I supposed to make of Protestants? Protestants were wonderful. They were the people next door, and they knew how to fix the lawnmower. And they also could um, change fuses for us, because we were entirely useless. It was an academic family, and each one was more useless than the one before. Uh, that's what Protestants were. Um, there was also the very perplexing matter for a small child about Ruth, go and put that piece of rubbish in MacDowell or Otway Riven. This was the two rubbish baskets in the kitchen. One of them was named after R.B. MacDowell, the distinguished professor, which was wet rubbish. <laughs> the one for dry rubbish was after Jocelyn Otway Riven, who did, I did learn later on, write the driest history anybody ever wrote. But what was I supposed to make of that in vis-a-vis -vis Protestants when I was three? But I discovered them later. Uh, there was also, oh yes, I knew about Northern Protestants as well, because they were seen to be rather different. Very, very blunt. Uh, Professor Theo Moody's wife, Ursula, was uh, part of the folklore, because she came, my, my father was very friendly with Moody. Ursula came to see the family when my brother was born six years before me, and my mother showed him off with great pride, and Ursula looked at him, and in her Belfast accent, she said, I can't do it, I'm sorry, she said, uh, what a singularly unattractive child. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to beware of them. Why I ended up with them is another question. Um, and how did I, I suppose? This is a bit of a memoir, but it is obviously about the South. Because I was born into the nationalist tribe, Catholic tribe. Um, so how did I end up being seen as a turncoat, a traitor, a neo-unionist, a lickspittal to the British government and various other things, much ruder? Um, it happened. It just happened, really. I call myself British-Irish because I was born and brought up in Ireland. I carry an Irish passport. Um, but I've lived in... England since I was 21, uh, and then I've become terribly close to Northern Ireland, and I'm confused, so I'm British-Irish. Um, this is a form of treachery, I have been told frequently. And to give an idea of how unpopular I became, really because I was trying to explain Northern Irish Unionists, particularly to the South, and also explain what I thought of the IRA, um, I should say that 2005, I came back to Dublin, which I often came back to, to celebrate the Literary and Historical Debating Society in University College Dublin, of which I had been a, a rather silent but incredibly enthusiastic member. It was very much from boys, because boys learned to debate at school and girls didn't. So we were afraid to open our mouth unless we were Maeve Binchy. Um, and... Uh, but I adored it, absolutely adored everything about it. So I came back to celebrate some uh, anniversary or other in 2005. And it was lovely to be seeing old friends again from UCD, and I remembered them so well. It was, I adored UCD. And uh, I was very early in proceedings. I was having a chat with uh, a judge, Hugh O'Flaherty, who was kind enough to say, I've been reading your book on the Orange Order, and I think it's really, really, at which stage we were interrupted by Ricky Johnson, who was um, a judge, just died, yes. Now, I'd been passionately in love with Ricky when I was a hanger-on at the LNH when I was about 14. He was incredibly articulate and wonderful in every young girl's dream, really. They were a bit odd. Um, and um, I had seen him once, I think, at my father's funeral in between, but I still had this romantic, slight memory. And Ricky Johnson interrupted me 
and said, I never read a word she says. It's all balls, 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 balls. And walked away. So there was the first person. And then the next one who came in was somebody I'd known terribly well in London and uh, New York. He was a diplomat, DFA. I haven't seen him for a few years because he'd been off in foreign parts. And he came up and said, oh, hello, Ruth. Nice to see you again. What a pity you've become a unionist. How sad this is. The whole evening going to be like this. And it was, it was a bit. I, I hadn't appreciated how unpopular I'd become because my views were unfashionable in Dublin 4, really. Um, I suppose I was a, an oddity because I was brought up in a very strange household, it has to be said, um, for which I would be ever be grateful. I can com combat union on uh, grannies. My God, my granny was something else. My granny had been a passionate Catholic who got seized by um, boredom and uh, then a desire for revolution, and she turned, well, I would have thought mad, when she, in 1916, um, because she got so excited and carried away. She was, um, she had this enormous picture over the mantelpiece in her bedroom, she lived upstairs, uh, of the scene in the GPO, and she used to pick them all out for me, uh, all these great men. Um, she also introduced complications, viz, like that she was very friendly with the widow of Tom Clark. So sometimes grandmother would come back in of an afternoon and say, I was at tea with Mrs. Tom Clark. So, very good. What did she say? She said, the Pierces think they own 1916. And I wonder, what was I supposed to make of it? <laughs> so what could I do in the end but end up writing a biography of Patrick Pierce? I was so confused. Um, so there was upstairs this... Uh, political necrophilia, really. Grandmother was obsessed with this. Um, she had married an English pacifist turned, uh, Methodist turned Quaker, who was a lovely man. Everybody loved grandfather. Um, and he had married this person who turned into a total harridan. Uh, and uh, I mean, she'd, she'd gone through the suffragette phase, fine, and the zealous Catholic phase, but the revolutionary stage stayed with her for the rest of her life. And to give you an idea, when my father was 13 and his brother was 11, she told them to go and join the Civil War on the side of the um, anti-treatyites. And my father said, certainly not. And his brother said, yeah, that'd be great. And off he went. And he was sent home. That was the end. But well, that was grandmother. You know, she didn't do things by heart. And having been... Um, taken against Dev in a big way. My mother taught me to say up Dev to her and that drove her crazy. She had become mad Republican, anti-Catholic church because they hadn't done the right thing in 1916. And um, she also became a fascist. So at the end of her bed was a picture of Hitler. <laughs> I could go into that at some length, but I won't. Anyway, that was Granny and she was upstairs and uh, for a very bad time period, the other granny was downstairs, and she was really apolitical. And her husband had been in the British Army uh, and had been a home ruler. And she wasn't, well, she was, she was apolitical, but she was terrified of upstairs granny. And there was one occasion when she called my brother into her bedroom to show him her husband's medals. And he, she said, whatever you do, don't tell her upstairs, or I'll never hear the end of it. So... There was the grannies, and then there was um, my father, who was um, devoted to his father, but then deceased, uh, loathed his mother, but had a sense of duty, and was trying to change the narrative of Irish history, he was a professor, uh, to represent the history of all the people in Ireland, wherever they came from or whatever they were, um, and get it away from the Republican narrative, the very narrow one. And he wrote something which actually Roy Foster dug up in his vivid voices, which made me very proud, actually. As he referred to a young historian who wrote something in 1955. And when I looked up the footnote, it was my father. And it was a piece of journalism in, a, in a, an out, something called a leader, I think. As long as our recent history is presented as a one-sided justification of the roles played by our leaders in 1922, so long will it be impossible to make it palatable to the children. When will all the survivors of the civil war on both sides
be big enough to admit their failure of judgment. As long as they keep silent, their followers are committed to justifying Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael in terms of mutual hate. Until it is clear to the meanest intelligence that one can be a good Irishman and disagree with Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, or even with the rising of 1916, Irish unity will continue to be a vain hope. We haven't moved on that much. Um, my mother then was a, the son of a, the daughter of a gamekeeper in Cork, O'Sullivan, um, who was a home ruler and in the British Army. And um, her love was for the Irish language and English literature. Um, how confused was I? Um, so she taught me about the wonders of Victorian novels and P.G. Woodhouse and uh, black Irish humour and Flann O'Brien and all of it, and uh, also a love of the Irish language, but she never pushed it down my throat. And then my brother was a rampant, mad activist socialist. Anyway, uh, it was an interesting background, and we always had the Protestants next door to change the fuses, so we were okay. And I went to University College Dublin, which I loved, but I was always struck by incongruities, like it was non-denominational, but why was the main lecture room called after Archbishop Walsh? You tell me. There was another one named after Kevin Barry, indeed. I went to an all-Irish-speaking primary school where, indeed, one of the teachers was a, a first cousin of Lord Haw Haw. And it was very clear where everybody's... Uh, and our solicitor, our family solicitor, had become uh, pro-Nazi during the war. So there was another complication. Uh, my parents were not keen on Nazis. And, um, indeed, my brother told me a few years back something that took me slightly aback that I had been removed from my grandmother's bedroom. I had been sent to stay with her because she had become widowed and it was keep her company. But when I came into the kitchen at the age of four doing the Hitler salute, <laughs> yes, they thought enough was enough. Anyway, I was a, a questioning child, I suppose you could say. I, I didn't like um, my primary school. And I didn't like all these pictures of great patriots around the walls, especially as nobody ever seemed to know anything about them. And I started asking questions about Patrick Pierce, uh, of history teachers. They hadn't a clue, except he was the greatest man who ever lived. It, we were told in the um, textbook that he was the noblest man in Irish history. Uh, I mean, it, it was very odd, Ireland, at that period. We're talking about the 1950s. And uh, it didn't change much, actually, when the, si the early 60s, by the time I left in 65. Um, I didn't like the Catholic Church. I didn't like the, uh, the fact that we appeared to be ruled by them. So, frankly, I couldn't wait to get out of Ireland. I got out at, on, on the day I got married at 21. A very foolish habit many of us had. Um, I was getting married at 21. Um, I left and um, went to Cambridge. And I became a teacher, which I was no good at. And uh, then did a, some, uh, yeah, an academic degree. And I thought I would be an academic. And then I realized I couldn't stand academics. So that wasn't a good idea either. So I ended up joining the civil service. So this is the process of becoming sort of anglicized. I still didn't want any part of Irishness. I was devoted to my parents. And I had some wonderful friends from university. But. Um, I was an outsider in the civil service. I mean, I, I ended up being an outsider in my native country as well. And I kind of came to be okay with the status of outsider. Um, I ended up deciding to leave the civil service and be a freelance writer. And I had written a biography of Patrick Pierce, just to get to the bottom of this bloke, really, to get some idea of what he was. And I was very fortunate. A lot of papers became available. It was a critical success. It also earned me a whole lot of enemies um, who baffled me initially. I didn't realize I had done a bad thing by revealing a human being with failings and virtues. I got quite fond of him, actually. I mean, I think he had a terrible effect, but I, he meant well. Um, I wanted to get away from Ireland, though. I mean, I had been pulled back by being offered this book and Pierce. So I wrote a book about uh, a Jewish publisher called Victor Gollans. I took on the history of The Economist, and I thought I was staying away from Ireland, but I was pulled back into it because I didn't want to be leaving a sinking ship and 
the IRA was bombing London and I wasn't going to deny my Irishness. So I got pulled into the Irish scene, chair of something called British Association for Irish Studies and there was an awful lot of that. And I got pulled into Northern Ireland, matters Northern Irish. And uh, initially it was very simple. You went to the meetings of the British Irish Association and the nationalists, I knew some of them. They were all very nice to me. I had friends there. I knew almost none, almost no unionists. And um, basically the point was nobody liked the unionists. And goodness me, they didn't try to be very nice. I mean, they were all seemed to be Ursula Moody's as far as I could see. They were, um, they were blunt to the point of rudeness a great deal. Um, the nationalists were always charming, uh, a bit touchy, almost touchy. The unionists charmless and obdurate. Uh, neither of them tried to understand each other as far as I could see. And the English just sat there trying, begging everybody to be rational. Uh, you know, the, believe the best of each other, reach an accommodation. Always using that phrase I came to hate, which was, it's always used by the English political class on the Today programme and so on. Is the truth not always sometimes in the middle? No, it bloody isn't, actually. Quite often it isn't. Um, but anyway, that the English have that as a kind of um, religion. I discovered gradually that the nationalists were not as nice as they seemed, and the unionists were rather nicer. Well, they could hardly have been less nice than they appeared on the surface. I came to like bluntness. You know, and I also came to like argumentative Presbyterians. I mean, I know that they're all pres they're all argumentative, but like Jews, I liked people who disagreed with each other because I really didn't like the fact that when I was growing up, nearly everybody was part of a herd mentality about everything. So I got even more confused. I also, you know, I liked with the the Northern prods. They seemed to say what they meant, and I mean what they said. So, somewhere or other, I wrote, you know, it's no wonder they have such difficulty with the English desire to fudge and the Southern Irish desire to please everybody. Um, lonely being a unionist. I listened to John Hume, I mean, initially being blown away by his um, articulacy and his rhetoric. Um, but I listened to that speech too often. It was known as his single transferable speech. Um, and it was all about how... Um, you know, we're just a divided people. And what I was beginning to learn uh, by observation over several years, the British Irish Association, was that actually what we had on the island was tribalism. Um, Tim Pat Coogan, I don't know if he means much to some of you, but he became a very successful uh, writer of an imaginary kind of history. Um, I remember him, I mean, I had actually been the foolish person who said you should get Tim Pat, because I was on the committee by then. I said you should get Tim Pat Coogan because you can't get Sinn Féin, so you should have people who are representing his point of view. So I remember Coogan just announcing at some meeting, uh, speaking for now, we're talking about speaking for the South. Oh, he said, unionists have no culture. And there was a sudden panic among all the English. Uh, about this, oh my goodness, it's a very difficult thing to say. What, what do they have a culture? What is it? You know, um, the unionists, I think, had left that, but weren't even in the room for some reason. They so um, various sort of <laughs> nice people began to s try to remember if, if they had produced ballet dancers or composers or whatever. Uh, nobody thought about the musical tradition because that was fatally plebeian and they didn't know about it. Um, and somebody said, "What about Louis Magnus?" At which stage Coogan said, oh, he's like the Ulster prod poets. They don't count because they turned against their own people. And, you know, it was only a while later I remembered um, James Joyce, Frank O'Connor, Edna O'Brien, <laughs> Sean O'Casey and all the Irish Catholic um, writers who turned against their own people, you could say. Um, so, I mean, that was the quality of stuff you were getting from the less polite southern crowd. Paul Bew, I remember, lovely, polite, um, sweet Paul Bew, the historian. He wrote quite a cross review of Joe Lee's otherwise wonderful book on Ireland, 1912 to 1985. And he said, really impressive, but absolutely hopeless and Ulster Unionist, he said. He said he is scathing about the sterility of the Protestant imagination. This was in the very period when C.S. Lewis... E.R. Dodds, 
Louis Magnice and Ernest Walton were flourishing. Everything from Narnia through brilliant Greek scholarship, outstanding poetry, to Nobel Prize winning work in atomic en energy. Um, I, came across, I came across later a wonderful explanation of the tribes in Northern Ireland. Um, Macaulay in the 17th century. He was comparing the Scots and the Irish temperaments. Now really, of all the people to put together, the Scots and the uh, indigenous Irish were a terrible combination. Um, and he just had this paragraph. He said, in natural courage and intelligence, both the nations which now became connected with England ranked high. In perseverance, in self-command, in forethought, in all the virtues which conduce to success in life, the Scots have never been surpassed. The Irish, on the other hand, were distinguished by qualities which tend to make men interesting rather than prosperous. <laughs> they were an ardent and impetuous race, easily moved to tears or to laughter, to fury or to love. Alone among the nations of Northern Europe, they had the susceptibility, the vivacity, the natural turn for acting and rhetoric, which are indigenous on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. I think that's fabulous and utterly true. Um, and then, oh yes, I'll give you this memory of uh, an occasion in the British Irish Association, where, which was full of people who really were trying to understand what was happening in Northern Ireland, really trying to understand all the players. And it was um, when there was a lot of carry-on over Orange Parade. And the nice, decent liberals were really trying, Dub Dublin and London ones. Um, but, sorry, I have missed... Oh, yes, here it was. Yeah, it was 1996. I was standing in a bar with two Northern Irish or or orange men. Uh, and a third one came up and said... I spent an hour last night, I'll tell you who the people were afterwards, you want to know. I spent an hour last night explaining to X and Y, two intelligent and sophisticated members of the Doyle, why I'm an orange man. One of them has just bounced over to me and said, we've been talking about you and we've all decided you can't be an orange man, you're too nice. <laughs> so the second orange man replied, I was in Dublin a while ago when someone in the group I was with, who had known me quite well for several years, said, why don't you tell those awful orange men to stop those parades? And he said, uh, I explained that I was an orange man, and they all said, you're not. And I said, I am, and they said, you're not. And I said, okay, have it your way. Obviously, when I think I parade through Belfast in a collarette on the 12th of July, I'm suffering from delusions. And the third orange man, who had always believed the southern Irish ma mind was totally closed, that it was a waste of time trying to explain anything, said, there you are, what did I tell you? Um, then I had the change of, this is before I began writing political journalism, so the early 90s. I was quite well known on the British Irish circuit because I was on the committee of this thing and I was, you know, I was seeking to understand like anybody else. And I was sort of rated as um, an observer. I think they had me down as who was sort of steady. So some very nice civil, English civil servant who had been involved in all the discussions about the Anglo-Irish Agreement and all the sort of stuff, and had become very friendly with the people in Dublin, um, had decided to have a new kind of conference. Um, the point being this time that instead of discussing that which divided us vis Northern Ireland, we would discuss that which united us, which was the EEC. I mean, this was rather foolish thinking. I was asked to go, they weren't having politicians at this, it was just officials and a few people like me. And I thought, but they really get on terribly well when it comes to Northern Ireland because they all think that Northern Irish people are savages. I mean, that really unites the diplomats from Dublin and London, as far as I could see. And I was quite friendly with a lot of them. Um, but no, they thought it divided them. So the EUC was the thing, and we'd all look to the wonderful future hand in hand. And it was going to be like Koenigswinter, yeah. So I went to this with some curiosity. 
And I, as I wrote about it afterwards, what was starkly revealed was that the English mindset is Protestant and the Irish is Catholic. As Macaulay said, we are indeed like a Mediterranean nation. At every turn in looking to the future of the EEC, English diplomats urged caution, thinking things through, making sure the foundations were secure, putting brick on brick, and so on and so on. And I was watching the Irish equivalents getting absolutely frustrated beyond belief. Um, they kept saying, no, we've got to look beyond that. I mean, that's really just small stuff. You know, we don't want, we've got to think of the big vision. And eventually, one of them, who was notorious for, he didn't even drink, this guy. He never lost his temper. He was incredibly calm. He was regarded by all the English diplomats as somebody they wished they had. He suddenly lost his temper completely for the first time ever in my experience and said, he said, surely we have to have vision, he said. We must think in a European way. We must make a leap. We must remember the Holy Roman Empire. Well, really, the Holy Roman Empire was not going to go down terribly well with the British Foreign Office, they know. They might be trying to see the other chap's point of view, but it didn't extend to the Holy Roman Empire. Um, you see, the tribalism, I mean, you can't stop the way you think, and the difference of vision was extraordinary, really, and it still is. Um, but what was d troubling me greatly, and I had begun to write, um, after this, I began to write political journalism, and I got involved in trying to explain the unionist point of view, because they seem to be useless at explaining themselves, and somebody has to do it. Um, there were about four journalists in, in the south of Ireland who were not getting all tribal, um, or who were not doing the bidding of the Department of Foreign Affairs, who said, you mustn't upset the peace process boat. Um, so I was one of the four who kept saying, can we remember that the IRA are a share of bastards and we shouldn't trust them? And um, I was so I was being unhelpful to the peace process. Um, where was... <sighs> Then the drum cree thing happened. I don't know how many of you will remember that. But it was um, essentially came across because the, your, the orange men are worse than your average unionist in making the, the case for themselves. It was seen as bully boy orange men marching through Catholic neighborhoods in order to uh, torment them. And, um, and it wasn't that, actually, because I was close enough to it to know it wasn't. And um, some of you here won't want to believe that, but it was an actual strategy that the provosts had got into place in order to deal with the absence of being able to kill people. So the thing was cultural devastation, really, and the setting of the prods against the state. That was what they were at. And uh, for those of you who might not think that was true, um, an enterprising reporter got into a particular uh, meeting of um, Sinn Féin with a recorder in 1997. And uh, Adams, Jerry Adams, was there. There had been three massive confrontations at Drum Cree. The Orange Men, the Unionists' names were mud all over the world by then. And um, he didn't know there was somebody from outside there with a recording device. He said, ask any activist in the North, did Drum Cree happen by accident? And they will tell you no. Three years of work on the lower Ormo Road, Portadown, and parts of Fermanagh, and Newry, Armagh, Armagh, and in Bellahy, and up in Derry. Three years of work went into creating that situation, and fair play to those people who put the work in. They are the kind of scene changes that we have to focus on and exploit. It was entirely planned, but um, nobody down south wanted to hear it. And I was finding, I was losing friends because of what I was writing. And I'm not used to that because I don't see why you would fall out with your friends just because they take a different view in politics. But I was, I was hemorrhaging them actually. Um, I mean, they thought I had gone mad and, um, you know, didn't, didn't appreciate, had, had got deluded by orange men. Somebody actually wrote a pamphlet on me, quite a long one, he was a psychiatrist. He said that I had been driven insane by lambeg drums. <laughs> It did. It was actually such an unreadable book, I couldn't read it except for that bit. Um, but the de demonization was, was uh, extraordinary. And there was a fantastic letter around that time in the middle of the 90s about the Southern response by one of the odd heretics in the South 
there is this herd mentality in the South. Heretics are rare, and it's not a popular position to be in because you get burnt to death. His name is Dick Keane. Just wrote a letter to the Irish Times, and it said, for an instant, our civilized veneer cracked. From every politician and church leader, from every TV, radio, and newspaper commentator, from every phone-in and chat show, from every workplace and pub conversation, poured all the old tribal cliches. All the defeats, wounds, hurts, and humiliations suffered by our tribe were rehashed with relish. All our myths, misappropriations, fears, bitterness, and hatred of the unionist British tribe were superbly articulated. The voices could have been Serb or Hutu, Croat or Zulu. There was enough rhetoric in the past week to sustain and justify our tribal warriors, IRA, INLA, in waging war on our tribal enemies for at least another 25 years. It was around that time I was um, asked to go on a panel in Cork for RTE, what was it called, Questions and Answers, uh, with Martin McGuinness. And I wasn't very chuffed about this, uh, not that I'm afraid of these guys, but I did know that the IRA were spending a lot of money on being uh, groomed to do well on the screen. Now they were permitted on, uh, permitted on the airwaves, and I knew he would do it very, very well. And I wasn't that accustomed, I wasn't really accustomed to broadcasting at all. But it was the same sort of feeling that somebody's got to do it. So I went to Cork, and um, he was indeed uh, very impressive in his way. It did seem to my me, I lived in London, I took a big interest in Northern Ireland, that maybe people would be a bit concerned that the IRA ceasefire was over. I mean, they'd gone back to killing people, but... It didn't seem to be bothering people very much. They weren't killing many people, you know. It's got to get these things in perspective, I think, is the way they'd be feeling. Um, so I took a kind of harsh line with McGuinness, and um, at some stage he said, well, if it's not the way to do it, how would you do it? I said, I'd intern you and Jerry Adams for a start. Well, this didn't go down, this didn't go down well with the public. And, I mean, at the end of that programme, um, this, <laughs> well... What it seemed to me at the time, a very aged woman came up to me and said, you should be heartily ashamed of everything you do. It's a terrible thing that you said today. It's shocking. And anyway, she ranted a bit. And then the man standing behind her, when she went out of earshot, said, I'm really sorry. That's my mother. And I'm a civic guard. And I know it's true, everything you said. <laughs> but he wasn't going to say that in front of his mother. Oh, yes, I sorry, I lift out one thing about that conference, the one about the British and the Irish dif different mindsets, was that that was the time I realised I didn't think like an Irish Catholic anymore. I didn't do the vision thing. I just didn't. Um, partly because of my time in the civil service, I learned pragmatism. So I had no time for unquantified vision. And, and I used to think a lot about the law of un unintended consequences. I still do. I put on the blurb of one of my books later that I was intellectually English and temperamentally Irish. And the Irish took deep offence at that. I mean, see, the English don't really take offence. They're used to being abused all over the world, really. But the Irish take anything they think is a slur extremely badly. So I, I wrote a, a satirical novel once on the peace process. Did not go down well in Ireland, I can tell you. Um, so... Where am I now? How many? How long have I got left? Oh, another five. Okay. Um, I will um, leap forward. What I was finding in Dublin that really frightened me was that people, people didn't wish to hear what was happening up there. They didn't wish to. I mean, I'm talking about educated people. They just wanted to believe what they'd always believed, and they wanted to believe that the unionists were absolutely dreadful and that um, all the people who have been killing people were doing it really for, um, uh, well, because they were driven to it. And I, I, mean, I remember one of them saying to me once, that he was a professor of history, for God's sake, um, saying, I mean, it's just grotesque that Trimble doesn't call the orange men off. And you say, 
but he can't. He's only an ordinary orange man. He hasn't any authority. Don't be ridiculous, he's the leader of Elder Street. You couldn't explain it. I mean, this guy was supposed to know about these things. Um, try to explain the Presbyterian mindset. Couldn't do it. There was Catholic mind uh, believes in hierarchies. You know, we were used to hierarchies. The Pope told a cardinal who told a bishop who told, you know, told us. Um, it wasn't, I mean, getting to know Presbyterians were, was extraordinary. I did get very fond of them, really, but they were impossible. You know, it's 11 opinions between 10 of them. It isn't even just 10. But there was an open-mindedness about stuff, and you could, you could criticize unionists. That's what I came to like, you know. You could say, well, I think you're wrong about that. And they wouldn't stomp off in a rage because you'd criticize them. They didn't even make, mind you making jokes much once they got to trust you. you know. um, I mean, I, well, John Hume um, was... John Hume announced that I was working for MI5 because I criticised him once. That was the routine. I mean, John couldn't take any kind of criticism. Um, and he called himself inclusive and everything. A David Trimble, who does not have much in the way of social graces, it has to be said, but who became a very good friend of mine, um, he was seen as a bigot, and he ended up acquiring friends from Catholic friends. I mean, you know, lots of them. Owen Harris wrote a lot of his Nobel Prize speech. Owen Harris from the Sunday Independent, ex-official IRA. His main advisor on how to deal with Sinn Féin was an ex-IRA terrorist, Sean O'Callaghan. You know, he, and, and I became a really good friend, and he wasn't a bigot. I'm sorry to say John was. Uh, John, John would have, n I wouldn't, wouldn't say that John wouldn't have had a Protestant friend, but the Protestant friend would have had to be a nationalist. It's the same old thing. Always have to be. And I remember really, the, been quite depressed by when Trimble and Hume got the Nobel Prize. And it was very funny because Trimble was woken up in the middle of the night and interviewed about it. And they said, how do you feel? And he said, it's too early. <laughs> That's what he meant. I think it was a rather honorable thing to say. But he was supposed to say, I'm so excited and I'm doing this for peace and it's all wonderful. You know? Anyway, he wrote, a, he did a wonderful speech, the Nobel Prize, I thought was wonderful. Um, and it was, because he's a huge reader David. I mean, he really reads and thinks a great deal. And it was, you know, it drew on Edmund Burke a lot and Amos Oz and George Kennan, who was the expert in post-war American foreign policy. And it was full of bleak truths. Um, and he tries to explain the difference between the mindsets of the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland. And, you know, he said, we have, we don't do vague and visionary statement where, where statements were suspicious of them. The tradition from which I come, but by which I am not confined, produced the first vernacular Bible in the language of the common people and contributed much to the scientific language of the, of the entitlement. Puts a great price on the precise use of words and uses them with circumsection. So much so that our passion for precision is often confused with an indifference to idealism. Not so but I am personally and perhaps culturally conditioned to be sceptical of speeches which are full of sound and fury, idealistic in intention, but impossible of implementation. And I resist the kind of rhetoric which substitutes vapour for vision. Now, I don't think he was getting at John Hume, but that was John's. John did his single transferable speech for the Nobel people as well. And it was full of Martin Luther King and, you know, peace and love and everything. Well, the effect on Ireland of this speech of Trimble's, which was, you know, the one in which he said, you know, that um, the, the, the Unionists had been frightened and had built a solid house, but it was a cold house for Catholics. That was quite a big thing to say. Not at all. In the South, uproar. He'd affront fronted us. He'd criticised vision. And I, what sort of man was he at all at all? And... Uh, I mean, I remember meeting that the evening of that, and in my innocence, I can still be innocent, I said I ran into a diplomat at some party, an Irish diplomat, and before I could open my mouth to say, wasn't that an interesting speech, he said, wasn't that a disgrace, an absolute disgrace, shocking speech, dreadful, why was he being so offensive? Uh, Tim Pat Coogan wrote a column in which he said that um, it was like making Caligula's horse a senator, giving him the Nobel Prize. I mean, really? Hmm. So, I'm talking about the attitudes of the South. Well, um, in some ways, nothing has changed. What I did, it was all very education for me because I learned how to be very unpopular. Uh, when I produced my book in the Orange Order, 
with a few uh, exceptions, it didn't help. Um, I, I mean, the point was I had built a bridge over to the other side, and now they were burning down my end of it, you know. Because you're, if you get, if you make friends with another tribe, you essentially get expelled from your own. That's just the way of it. You get used to it. I mean, I do have some friends in Ireland, but I mean, there was one friend of mine who was in a job where he had to keep in with everybody, and we talk pretty well every week. He used to tell me every week, you know, it was a dinner party in Donnybrook the other day, and I denied you again because he'd, he'd be. I had a column in the Sunday Independent. I'd, He'd be sitting there and, you know, somebody would say, did you read what that bitch Ruth Dudley Edwards said? And James would like, I'm not going to upset anybody, no, no, no. <laughs> he didn't, and that was fine, I understood that. And then I got involved with the OMA victims. Uh, you know, the 1998 terrible bomb. And it was the usual stuff. They, you know, there was no evidence to get the people who had done it, even though everybody knew who they were. And finally, some victims thought it would be a good thing to take a civil case. And I got involved at the very beginning with make, helping them network and raise money and so on. And I spent years with this. And I would tell people in Dublin, and I had a few friends there who were lawyers who were still nice to me. And they'd say, this is just ridiculous. There's no chance of this. It's completely stupid. Why are you wasting your life? with all about? And actually, after years, we won. You know, case was won. And it was a fantastic um, victory against <coughs> against terrorism. But uh, the indifference in the South, I mean, the attitude to OMA, everybody got terribly sorry for the OMA victims for a while, but they wanted them to move on and shut up. That's what always happens, I find, in the South, always. Why are they going on about it? It's a bit like, why do the Jews keep going on about the Holocaust? Because it was actually quite bad and it kind of does stuff to you. Um, the, the, the cheery bit I can give you is that I think we have come on a great deal in some respects, not when it comes to Northern Ireland, really, but um, in terms of dealing with our own past, because for the centenary, I did a book called The Seven on the Seven Signatories of the Proclamation. And I'd had um, relatively rough treatment at some summer schools and that kind of thing, but I was invited to speak at a lot of events that year, and people were so different because they'd been applying their minds to the legacy of 1916. They'd been reading about it. They'd been hearing conversations that were not the usual claptrap anymore, real conversations. And I think the summer schools and festivals like this have done an enormous amount of good because people actually sit and listen and realize that it is more complicated than you think. Um, so I was actually terribly cheered up by that. Um, I, we have not got away from this, what I call the Mrs. Doyle notion, which is that it'll all be grand with the, the North when they realise they're really Irish. You know, you're Irish. No, I'm not. I'm British. Ah, go on. You're Irish. No, I'm not. Ah, go on, go on, go on. Yeah. I mean, so the Mrs. Doyle view is still pretty prevalent because obviously it's awful being a unionist because you're a miserable git, whereas it's wonderful being us because we have a great time. Very nicely put, there's a guy called Doug Beatty who's a um, Ulster unionist. He, was, he won a military cross in uh, the British Army in the last few years. He's a terribly liberal, open-minded man. And he, like Trevor Ringland, the uh, ex-rugby uh, player, you know, are very anxious to be Irish and British and be all the complexities, but they don't want to be told they're just Irish. They don't want it. And he did an article the other day on this, just saying, my identity and culture is proudly represented by the Union flag, God Save the Queen, Ulster and Irish Rugby, Gaelic Games, The Shamrock, Guinness, St. Patrick's Day, Derry and Londonderry, The Sash My Father Wore, Poets and Authors, Actors and Artists. I support all the home nation's football teams unless they are playing Northern Ireland, and I support the Republic of Ireland unless they are playing the home nations. I'm an Ulsterman, I am Irish, and I am British. I am made up of many things, and I share many things with those who live in the same space as me yet view themselves purely as Irish, British, or an Ulster Scot. Um, and, you know, a lot of them would say that. But don't make us be Irish. And I'm very encouraged. It's partly because of events like this. People are now suddenly saying, gosh, United Ireland isn't actually them all deciding tomorrow that they'd be better off down here. It's really complicated. 
and we got to talk about it. And you know, when you get Leo Varadkar saying, well, I wouldn't want to be United Ireland now. No, um, no, sorry, yeah, we're a bit busy. And um, I have to talk about it. And the realization, the unintended consequence of Brexit, which is everybody realizes you can't get out of these things just by saying I want to. You have to rework the whole constitution. A new anthem, a new flag. Oh, what are you going to do about the simple fact that when it comes to legislation, Irish is the predominant language, so that dictates case law. What are you going to do about that? Have you got a million prods coming in from Northern Ireland? Tricky. So, I'm not all doom and gloom. It's been a very interesting time being coming a bad person in the South, but they're much nicer to me than they were up to two years ago. And, uh, and actually, my cheeriest memory from the whole uh, 2016 going around various places was going to the birthplace of Sean McDermott, where there was a summer school. And I knew there were some mad relatives, um, really mad relatives. I mean, they had never accepted um, the treaty. They still hadn't accepted the treaty. Um, and I, I thought it might be a bit hairy. And I had uh, a really difficult journey from London, and you know, the plane was late, and I missed a connection and all that sort of stuff. And when I finally arrived in the evening, and there was a eulogy of um, McDermott going on. And I was desperate for something to eat and a drink. And um, I couldn't see a pub in the village as I passed through, and uh, somebody brought out an enormous teapot, and I wasn't looking forward to that. And there was a lot of cake, and I don't like cake. And um, I felt depressed, and I thought, I don't know anybody here, and they're all going to hate me anyway. Um, so I'll ask somebody if they'll give me a lift to the boarding house, and I'll read a book. And then this very nice-looking man came over to me and said, would you like to come to the pub? Well, of course, <laughs> it's fine. I'm delighted to hear there is one. Um, and we walked out together, and he said, I read your book, I really liked it. I said, that's very nice of you, I'm so pleased. Um, he said, yeah, well, we'll go and meet my wife now and my, my uh, sister. Um, he said, my name is Sean McDermott. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm the great nephew, he said. So he lived in Brighton with his second wife, and he'd left um, Ireland over uh, corruption, really. He'd worked in Charlie Hawhey's firm, and he hated the corruption. And he now was... Uh, what was he? He was working, he was a social worker in Brighton. Lovely man, utterly lovely. We were thrown out of the pub in the end at midnight. Um, and we got on fabulously. And he was just, he did, he attended all the events to do with his great uncle, and he was interested in it, but he wasn't in the least uh, rigid, you know. Um, was his uncle, great uncle, right or wrong? To discuss, you know. So it just, we're doing well, but it's taking an awfully long time. But I think there's going to be a very fast education of Sinn Féin keep going on and on and on about a water pole at a stage when really nobody much other than them is looking for that complexity. And people are beginning to realise that nothing is simple, including a United Ireland. Thank you. Oh, I don't have to lie, don't I?